Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mike Marcellin, the Chief Marketing Officer at Juniper Networks. So first off, I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Um, obviously, the past several weeks have been challenging for all of us on both pro pro professional and personal fronts. But also, um, they've been incredible stress tests for our global internet as a whole and for all the corporate networks that we work on. So I gathered up a few statistics to kind of kick us off. Um, AT&T is telling us that their traffic is up 24% uh, over the past few weeks. Telia, which is a big Swedish carrier, said overall traffic volumes for, the, for them have been up by more than 50%. Uh, Atlas VPN said their VPN usage is more than doubled in some countries in Europe and up over 53% in the US. And Akamai has said their internet traffic is up over 25% and also their DDoS attacks are up 20%. Now, obviously some of these network spikes um, happen in a normal time when Netflix drops a new season of Ozark or Apple releases a major iOS upgrade, but now we're seeing sustained levels that are quite high. And obviously some of this will probably be temporary, but you know, I have to think that you know, this global pandemic is actually accelerating much deeper, longer term change in our habits uh, as, as people and consumers, and it may change how networks are built and managed going forward. And so that's ultimately what we wanna talk about today. And I have to say, I'm blown away by this powerhouse panel. Um, I think this may be the most accomplished group of networking experts ever assembled on a single Zoom meeting. So um, uh, we just wanna go around and, and, and pepper you each with some questions, hear a little bit about what you're seeing with the networks that you work on. Um, and what I'd like to do when I first come to you, just introduce yourself, um, and if you, could, if you could share one thing you've been thankful for these past few weeks, just obviously a lot of doom and gloom and a lot of challenge, but maybe one thing you've been thankful for, and I'll, I'll kick that off. Um, uh, about uh, nine months ago, I was for the first time an empty nester, um, but now over the past few weeks, I have both of my kids back in the house. Uh, my son is doing his university study remotely, mm -hmm. and my daughter, who had just started a new uh, job uh, in Washington, D.C., decided to work from home back at our home. So it, uh, even though it's kind of craziness around us, it's, uh, it's great to have people, uh, have the family all back together again. So with that, um, I'm going to start off, Andrew, with you. Um, so maybe just introduce yourself and give us something you're thankful for, and then I'll ask you a, a question. Yeah, um, my name is Andrew Alston. Um, I'm the group head of IP strategy um, for Liquid Telecommunications. Um, things to be thankful for, you know, the time spent at home in the last couple of weeks um, with my kids around and my family around has, it, it, it's been a very interesting experience. It's, it's kind of allowed me to grow closer to people. Um, at the same time, it's strangely, it's shifted a lot of the work habits of a lot of my colleagues. I find them working later at night and being a night owl myself. I'm finding this absolutely great. I can get hold of people at nine, 10 o'clock at night. And yeah, it's, I, I'm, quite, I'm actually quite enjoying um, the situation that I find myself in now, strangely enough. That's good, that's awesome. Well, so, so the question for you is, I mean, even in the best of times, Working in IT can be a bit of a whack-a-mole, you know, trying to keep things running and deal with challenges as they pop up or cyber threats as they pop up, whatever, what, what have you. And so, um, obviously, we just talked about a significant shift and spike in network usage. And so, I would suspect that that's led to even more of this. So, my question to you is, what are you doing to just keep up um, in this time? So, it's a very interesting question because if I look at how we construct our network. We have had a bit of an advantage here because we've constructed the network to always use N plus X resilience and redundancy. And I think the way to deal with these issues to kind of flatten the curve is to give yourself more time to resolve an issue because it takes more time to get people on site, etc. The more redundancy, the more resilience that you have allows you to take more time to fix things. The other strategy which we've kind of been experimenting with is, can we give more control to the customer to fix the problem? So if a customer is on a path that they don't 
particularly like because its metrics are out of bounds of what they want, et cetera. Can I give the ability to the customer to reroute themselves across our own network? And there's a lot of work going into the segment routing side on that um, and allowing customers to utilize the technologies that we've got to fix their own problems, which reduces the load on our engineers. And I think those are the two major things, but it's definitely more a case of the amount of resilience in the network and the fact that we can have failures and the customer doesn't feel it, which kind of flattens the curve and gives us more time. That means good planning on the front end is helping you now. Are, are, you, yeah. seeing, are you seeing customers, you talk about segment routing, are customers willing to try new things during this time or they just want to be like, no, nope, we just need to stick with what we know? I think they don't need to know about the segment routing. They get a web page that says, here, go reroute your path and a list of options, you know? And it's, so to them, you don't need to expose that level of technology. Obviously, some of the customers, you know, we've been introducing this for quite a while. I mean, we've been running segment routing in various forms since back in 17 for Junos, which is 2017, I think. Um, and so we've had some time to prepare for this, but it's certainly been an interesting experience because what you, what I do think we are seeing going forward is that you're going to never go back to what you were before this. The kind of work from home um, is going to really, I think, embed itself. Um, I also think that's going to have a tremendous impact going forward on things like enterprise business sales versus consumer sales versus cloud sales, because it's going to change the source and destination of traffic. And I think that is probably going to be the most interesting part to deal with how you deal with the shift in what is the business aspect of it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. So Stefan, I want to bring you in. So introduce yourself and give us something that you're thankful for. Uh, Stefan Fuan here, uh, CTO. I'm doing a lot of freelance work these days. And I'd, I'd say I think the thing that I'm probably most thankful for as probably I would suspect a lot of people here, just getting an opportunity to spend more time with uh, my daughter and uh, um, getting chance to spend more time with these fluffy animals right here and take them on nice long walks every day. So uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm pretty, pretty thankful for these days. Yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. I want to kind of extend what I asked Andrew about, about keeping up and more specifically for you is, um, you know, as you're trying to keep up, you know, how are you using automation? Are you using AI and ML? Um, what are some of the approaches you're having, um, you know, to uh, deal with this increase in a remote workforce and just needing to keep up uh, more rapidly? You know, to be quite frank with you, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, I'm doing a lot of AI and, and machine learning uh, at, at this moment to deal with the remote workforce. Um, you know, I, I can see how that may come into play uh, down the road, but uh, quite frankly, um, the, the things that, you know, I'm, I'm largely, you know, talking to customers and working with right now is um, you know, putting in things like remote access solutions and VDI solutions are really, really big right now. Um, I, I mean, I, I can anticipate that probably machine learning and AI will come into play, um, especially as we start looking more and more. And, and I happen to agree with Andrew in his previous comment about, um, I do believe this is going to dramatically, you know, change the landscape moving forward. And I think we, I suspect um, businesses will start looking, even once life starts to return back to normal, businesses will start to really aggressively take a look at, and revisit their work from home type policies. And, you know, for all the reasons that Andrew mentioned, that's going to really um, change the landscape in terms of the traffic patterns. And if you've got a lot more people, a remote workforce, um, you know, it's one thing when all your users are behind the corporate firewall and they are protected via um, the normal assets that we have in place. But now that people are increasingly, um, you know, going to be remote workforce and maybe using um, various cloud type products for SaaS, Office 365, Box, those types of things, we need to take a, a really big look at um, securing those things. And I think that's where AI and machine learning are really going to come into play is um, doing things like user entity behavior analytics, 
um, looking at traditional behavior for a user. And then when we see something that's sort of like outside of the bounds of what they would normally do, let's flag that um, as being something suspicious. And I think that's where um, machine learning um, algorithms and paradigms kind of come into play. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So Chris, I want to bring you and Jake Kitty into the conversation. Um, Chris, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Chris Park. I'm a senior network engineer over here in the UK in the ISP sector. And uh, that's Jay Kitty of Jay Kitty fame. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, uh, oh, well, one thing I'm absolutely grateful for. So uh, delighted to see every single day the doctors and nurses all around the world who are giving their lives to help all of the rest of us particularly here in the UK, we have our National Health Service, but I think all across the world, people are going out and clapping and applauding for the people who are far braver than me. They're, they're, just, a, they're just a different kind of person. They're, they're better than I will ever be. And I am grateful every single day they've looked after uh, more of my friends than I would care to mention, um, but they've all survived and it's all because of their incredible bravery. So very well said. Very well said. Um, of course, I agree with everything everyone said so far in regards to the, the, the flow of traffic, the new source and destination. I'm hearing interesting conversations about, you know, do you, are you absolutely sure that you want to tunnel 100% of your VPN traffic from the computer straight to the corporate firewall and then out? Are there arguments to perhaps let Zoom go out a different way? Perhaps to let Microsoft Teams go a different way? Sometimes, no. Of course, everything has to go through a corporate firewall if you need to monitor 100%. But I think people quite rightly didn't plan to have enough bandwidth at their head office um, for a global pandemic. Not many of us saw that happening. So there's some interesting conversations happening there. I mean, how do you make that happen? Is it possible perhaps to um, have dynamic prefixes pushed to your uh, end user's client on their computer so that it can be aware of, of Zoom's IPs, of Microsoft's IPs? Possibly, but that's a lot of IPs. So you need to make sure that the, you know, the, the, the laptop can handle that. More interesting, I think, in regards to systems, uh, and process. I think that we all in this industry have worked with people who, should we say, have made their jobs secure by keeping the knowledge up here rather than documenting it and making it widely available. And of course, you know, you will have your own opinions on how scalable <laughs> that is as a strategy. But at least when people do that and everyone's in the same office, you can be aware of how the network is supposed to look through conversation by poking people until they reply you know that there's ways of sometimes getting at least as much information as you need um i think business is now starting to realize that that doesn't work when those people are at home and they're not replying to messages and i am seeing not only in places that i've worked recently but from a lot of colleagues that conversations are finally starting to happen about let's get the network diagram on paper in one place where everyone can see let's bring in tools so that we don't have to design this ourselves every time manually let's just get it generated based on what happens in the network um let's write down our processes in some companies that's actually a controversial process because in fairness you know some companies grow quicker than they have staff to do the work and things get left by the wayside and then things scale out and look you have to find the positives in a time like this right no no one no one wants any of this but the way that you keep going is to look for the positives and i think that it, it's nice to see conversations happening to perhaps get rid of um, legacy toxic problems and bringing in uh, better documentation, better processes, clearer documentation, clearer processes. I'm finding a lot of um, colleagues through the chaos that managers are starting to suddenly wake up to this. And I think that's a positive thing. Has anything surprised you over the last few weeks? I mean, some of these were, are expected. If we had thought about this scenario, we might have expected how it would play out. Nothing surprised me. I, I anticipated 100% of all of this. This well was, They should have just come to me. I saw, I <laughs> fully, I don't know why the WHO wasn't just calling me up and saying, Chris, <laughs> come on, <laughs> let's have your expertise. Um, but I mean, well, I mean, of, I mean, of course, the obvious things that, we, that surprise us all is um, just how quickly things turn to, remote working the, the number of um friends that i've had not even necessarily in it who have just reported that culturally their bosses have said no you can't possibly work from home that doesn't work i mean how could it possibly work and suddenly we're finding actually no it can work to, <laughs> to at least a certain extent and um the, the one thing that i hope is that like i mean i 
what what a privilege that we live in a time where we can work remotely and we have a bit more life work balance one of the things that i really hope that this business will remember to think about though is that when a lot of your senior people your most experienced people do work from home they're not in the office or at least not as much you have to remember to still nurture your first liners and nurture the newcomers into the industry i was very lucky in my early days to work in the same office as some very brilliant minds and to learn from them and just be part of those conversations that you hear in the office even just to overhear things let alone to be able to go up to them and ask questions and say right draw it out and i certainly wouldn't want to go back to that way where no one could work from home it's better now but we do need to remember that the people who are coming into the industry now need to be nurtured still and they still need to be looked after. And so yeah. um, I hope that business and our colleagues will, you know, all remember that. Agreed. Christian, let's uh, add you to the conversation. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and, and your thank you for it. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Christian Scholz. I'm a senior security consultant for Telonic in Germany. And uh, yeah, what I'm most thankful for is that my family, my friends, and all of you are still healthy. Because uh, yeah, in, in, in these days, that's I think one of the most important things, staying healthy and uh, yeah, surviving this somehow. Okay, okay. So just uh, picking up where Chris kind of left off, you talked about mm -hmm. some of the um, potential lasting changes to this or, or how we're rethinking how we've done some things. And obviously coming from a security perspective, um, you're probably seeing some things as well that are like maybe this is teaching us some things or, or um, meaning we have to go back and be more planful in what we do. So you know, what have you seen that this has exposed that enterprises either didn't realize they needed to plan for or um, you know, what, what are they not thinking about that they should be during this time and going forward? I think uh, what, I, what I've seen in the uh, yeah, past weeks is that most of them didn't account for yeah, working from anywhere, um, basically having the bandwidth available everywhere and uh, yeah, having enough uh, remote access licenses, stuff like that, because uh, yeah, it was always like, okay, I have two or three people working from remote and yeah, the rest is basically at the headquarter working from there. And now all of a sudden they see, okay, they all can work from home. We have the technology, it's working just fine. And uh, yeah, now they realize, okay, but we don't have the bandwidth everywhere. And uh, yeah, we, we simply didn't plan for anything like that. And uh, yeah, basically they are now seeing the branch um, more critical because it was always like, okay, that's like a, like a home office workplace or a small branch. I don't need like a high SLA or something like that. And now all of a sudden they realize, okay, maybe we should take a look at that and uh, also bring the security in place because um, Obviously, all the bad people are also using this corona pandemic and yeah, still trying to get into your network. And right. now some of them are very thankful that you're yeah, connecting from anywhere. So um, yeah, you need to be aware of that. Yeah, actually, it was a follow-up question for you. And I kind of asked Andrew a little bit about this around uh, enterprises being willing to, to try new things. Because I know that you, you've helped so many companies migrate their networks from one vendor to another, including a lot come, up, come to Juniper, which we're, we're very thankful for. Um, how should enterprises think, like if they were planning a project, planning a migration, then this all hit, um, should they be still open to doing that in a planful way or should they just hunker down and try to ride it out for a few more months? No, I think um, if you are carefully planning it, you can still do maintenance. Um, you, you have to take a little bit more time into the planning stuff because I've seen some of the data centers closing down, remote hands is not so easily these days. Um, some of my colleagues even have data centers in another country so they can't even yeah, travel there and access it. Um, it's the same with the maintenance. Uh, some of them are just postponing the maintenance, um, which I think yeah, can be quite lethal to your organization if you stop applying security patches just because you're afraid, okay, this is a yeah, central firewall. I can't update it because I could risk a little bit of downtime. Um, I think you need to very carefully plan these things, but still do them. Just, yeah, have faith in your people and uh, yeah, just do it. Yep, good advice. Nick. Looks pretty warm where you are. I hope that you've got a good fire extinguisher there. Yeah. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Toasty, yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Nick Rice. I'm a senior network architect with a company called Comsworld here in Scotland. 
Uh, and I am rather thankful for still being able to continue doing my job without wearing pants. Um, now, we have to, we have to wonder, is it the American version of pants or the UK version of pants? <laughs> I will leave that up to you. Um, yeah, so, so um, yeah, but all in seriousness, um, thankful that everybody in my family is healthy. I've got a, my wife is a, a nurse, so she's on the, the front line. Um, and, and so far, touch wood, um, we, we're all doing well. Um, and all the family around us are, are all healthy and you guys are healthy as well, which is fantastic. Good to hear. Um, well, so question for you. So even in the best of times, IT budgets are tight and they're challenged and now even more so. So how is all of what's going on in, in this transition into this uh, remote way of working made you reassess IT spending, IT priorities, both now and maybe even with a little bit of a crystal ball looking forward? Well, um, one of the things that's actually kind of caught us over the, the last couple of weeks, um, just before we went into lockdown, so we're now on to the, the fourth week of lockdown in the UK. We've had three weeks, um, a couple of days before um, the government announced that we kind of got a, an inkling of what was going to happen. So we, we tested our business continuity plan, um, which went reasonably well. Um, we're a, an ISP, so we have all our engineers have, have um, laptops and we've got field engineers that are out so everybody's used to just working away and, and working from where they can what we kind of omitted and forgot was quite a lot of the back office staff you know the accounts department and these type of people they all had desktop machines and it was a, a bit of an oversight so it was a bit of a scramble to do that um, but other, otherwise, um, you know, we've got a, a really robust VPN solution. Um, we've had to kind of quickly update some of our, our BYOD policies for, for connecting the corporate network. So I, I think for, you know, looking at spend going forward, I think one of the things for us and possibly even other companies is, you know, the, the, the cost difference now between desktops and laptops are, are negligible. So just go for a laptop. If somebody needs an extra couple of screens, just let them have it. So if we have a situation like this again, you know, it's just undock your laptop, go home, and, and you can work straight away. It's one of the biggest take homes I've have had over this recently. Yeah, it makes sense. So Tom, you're, looks like you're in the back cave. Give us, give us something you're thankful for and introduce yourself. Well, I'm Tom DeWire. Um, I'm a principal engineer working at Nexum. Um, the thing I'm happy for and, and thankful for is obviously being around my family. Um, my kids are getting older. I have a 13 year old and a 15 year old. So uh, when they go into high school, it's kind of, you're getting into your disappearing act where they're starting to distance you. So bringing them back in is, uh, is kind of nice. Also health of my family. My, I have a father who's over 80 years old. So for me, keeping him safe is, is critical. Mm -hmm. um, so from that standpoint, these are what I'm, what I'm thankful for. Good to, good to hear. So kind of picking up on where uh, Nick, Nick left, left off thinking about, he was thinking about desktops versus laptops so for you as you think about now, but you know, maybe as you think about, you know, if you're planning a 2021, you know, budget, um, how do you see what we're going through right now? And um, as many have said, maybe, you know, working remotely more will be a thing that, that will, that will uh, remain even post this crisis. You know, how do you see overall effect on you know, corporate IT networks and investments going forward? Well, well, it's funny because for traditionally, remote access has been about a small percentage of your overall corporate user base. So they'll go for 20, 30% of the concurrent user base that'll be out there. And that's all they built it on. So for a lot of our customers as a, as a, as a VAR, we, we saw that this was a possible risk. And we've been kind of pointing this out. If you, in the Midwest, we have uh, small events where we might have a blizzard or something that'll shut you in over a weekend. So we've been kind of through a smaller exercise of this with the entire population has to work from home, but not for the extent that this is gonna be. Uh, so we've been through this exercise a little bit. It still caught a lot of our customers off, off guard. Because all of a sudden now we have to stress out to 100% of their user base. So if, it, if they have the proper size circuits and equipment, it's simple. It's a licensing exercise. If they don't, now they have to go through the process of ordering new equipment. 
And one of the things we're seeing, especially now, is it's the, the, the late mean times to get this stuff out is now 90, 120 days. So you can't just get equipment. Uh, the laptop discussion, that is a critical one. Uh, we have customers that are trying to buy laptops and they are out of everything. So just going and trying to buy a large amount of laptops to move a bunch of your desktop users over is nearly impossible. It's like get me, you know, 100 of anything you have and just ship it so we have something to use. Um, so as we start to look at 2021, uh, this has to become part of business continuity. We have to build out our, uh, as an exercise of being able to move our workforce uh, as much as we can remotely, uh, which, you know, as we've heard numerous times in our discussions here today, is just something that's foreign to a lot of companies. The idea of I need to see physically this human being show up to my office or they don't work. Well, that's not the case. A lot of our jobs can be done remotely. And to me, I, I think it's actually more efficient because uh, guys like Andrew who work in the middle of the night, you know, and that's how I operate as well, it's easier for me to work on my own time uh, based on project work. So uh, you find that you're more efficient, uh, but you have to build out that network edge. So you have to make sure that your circuits are ready, you have the right network capacity, you have the right equipment. And then the other thing that's not thought about is the applications themselves. A lot of our applications are still fat applications that are latency sensitive. So just, you know, the idea of moving them remote becomes difficult. We go from, you know, five milliseconds of latency to 35 milliseconds of latency. You can have all the bandwidth in the world, but if your application doesn't take that sensitive uh, latency change, then it becomes unusable. So we have to think about this as we move forward. It's not just an exercise of capacity, but it's how everything works together remotely. That makes sense. Well, what about the actual IT team? Do you see that how IT operates? I mean, obviously supporting a very remote distributed workforce is different than supporting a centralized workforce. So that may be one change. Any other changes you're expecting in just how IT itself operates in the team? Well, I think one of the things is just how do you deliver equipment and services? So say, for instance, I realize that my internet circuit at my one of my offices is not up to par. So I go and I order a new internet circuit. That requires a human being to come out and be on site. Well, during a pandemic, that might not be available. Uh, in some of the offices in downtown Chicago, there is no access. They had somebody who had a possible COVID-19 uh, you know, infection, and they shut down the building. There's equipment that we sent, and the equipment is sitting there, and nobody has been able to verify that the equipment is there, that it's the proper equipment. It's just that we saw that FedEx dropped it off at the loading dock. So, you know, being able to start to think about how are we going to solve this in the long run is going to be critical because working remote is one aspect of it, but delivering IT services, uh, you know, there's, there's the remote access aspect of it, but then there's the physical connectivity that we need. We don't have smart hands at the buildings uh, for a lot of these data centers. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Bring you in uh, as well. Maybe introduce yourself and something you're thankful for. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Paul Clark, uh, Customer Solutions Architect at Fujitsu in the UK. Um, I guess a silver lining for me is seeing the communities come together um, to help each other. And um, as Chris, uh, I think, touched on, is uh, you know seeing the key workers get the um, the recognition that they they deserve. Yeah, I agreed. Um, so a question for you, uh, you know, obviously at Juniper, it's long been a focus to, you know, move our customers to cloud and to deliver solutions to enable them to do that. Um, we've talked a lot about distributed work, uh, rethinking cybersecurity. Um, what are you seeing and, and relative to the trend that was already happening about people moving to cloud and you see that accelerating because of this or changing in some way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we're seeing some projects stand up um, emergency uh, infrastructure in the cloud uh, at the moment. Um, Fujitsu in Spain has um, created a new uh, platform to enable 1,200 key work healthcare professionals to work remotely and access critical patient care applications. Um, and in the UK, um, we're standing up a new platform to help with um, domestic abuse so that um, some of the specialist uh, trained support workers can provide their um, 
crucial services remotely. So, um, you know, businesses are able to rapidly change their plans um, because of cloud technology. Um, the digital transformation has, has many benefits and has allowed businesses to maintain a level of uh, normality. So, you, so you, you expect just, you know, once the dust settles and we're looking forward that, you know, even an acceleration of that movement? Yeah. So, uh, you know, on the flip side to that, we in the UK, um, some of the supermarkets of uh, um, their websites now put you in a queuing system. And um, I'm guessing that's uh, to protect, you know, a complete, complete crash. Um, so I suspect that as we return to some sort of normality, that those types of um, customers will want to, to to move to the cloud to take um, take advantage of some of the um, elastic features, so they can scale up and scale down in the event of, of you know something like this happening again. Yep, makes sense. So um, I want to close this out with with kind of a, a lightning round with two questions. So we'll just kind of go around the horn and you know, jump in if you want um, on, on, on these questions. So the first one is, you know, after everything we just talked about, um, what advice would you have for other network operators during this time? Just as they're trying to navigate the uncertainty, um, what's, your, what's your piece of advice? Um, I, can, I can certainly start there. Um, I would say that the one thing I would say to all the network operators is use this as a learning opportunity realize that what we are facing today, it may well not be the last time. Um, and if you haven't prepared for this, use it as an opportunity to learn and prepare so that next time you are ready. I would also say that one of the things that we've seen you know, internally is an embracing of innovation. And this type of thing spurs innovation. And I would encourage companies to use this to embrace innovation rather than shy away from it. Now is the time to look for what do we do in the future? How do we change? How do we adapt? Rather than saying now is the time to hunker down. Now is actually the time to innovate and become what you can be. That would be my advice. Great advice. Other, other thoughts? Yeah, I think another thing is uh, collaborate. Talk to others who are in the same situation. Don't be shy. I mean, this is a situation literally no one has planned for. So uh, yeah, don't, don't be shy to, to ask things that you're yeah, all of a sudden confronted with like remote access and stuff. I mean, we have forums, we have Slack channels, we have so many ways to talk to each other. Just make use of it. And we're, we're the same here in the UK. We've had quite a lot of um, companies that in, let's say, peacetime that they're you know, direct competitors, but we've seen over the last couple of weeks that they've come to help each other. We've, we've got quite a lot of um, people in a, a Slack channel and for the UK of, of people within network operations who are saying, well, I live near here, I can go and do this in this data center if you need me to. And you know, you get people jumping in saying, well, actually, here's five things for five other, five other ISPs. Could you go and quickly do that for us? And it's, it's a very reciprocal arrangement and it's working out really, really well, especially with us being in Scotland. You know, the majority of our infrastructure is in Scotland, but um, with the UK and, and the internet here, it, it's very London centric at the moment. So for, for us to, to, to be able to fix anything in London, um, you know, at this point in time, would I fly? Would I get public transport or a train? Probably not. So I'm, I'm stuck with a nine hour drive. If I can stop the need for that, you know, I'll, I'll ask other people if they can do that for me. Yeah, good to hear. Other, other words of advice, Chris? Oh uh, yeah, um, I saw a really interesting tweet the other day. Um, and it, it gave a few things to remember while you're working from home. And what I'm about to say now isn't specifically for network engineers, it's just for everyone to remember, which is, um, I thought this is such good wording. It said, you are not working from home. We hear a lot of people say we're all working from home. And no, we're not working from home. We're at home during a crisis trying to work. And I think that when you remember that, you can be a lot kinder to yourself because it's so easy to think, oh, I haven't got as much work done as I would have got if I'd been in the office. Or, oh, my other colleagues seem to be coping so much better than me. You know, it's the whole Instagram thing of the thing you see isn't the reality, you know. And I think remembering that, remembering that we are all doing our best in extraordinary times 
uh, really helps you to be kinder to yourself. Yeah. Um, and, and, and one thing that I want to bring up, and this kind of built on something that Christian talked about earlier, is people are hunkering down a little bit and they're afraid of uh, doing things like updates and changes to critical hardware because nobody is there. Well, we can use this as, a, uh, as an exercise to figure out what are the things that we need to be able to be 100% remote. So do we need a console server? Do we need something that can remotely flip power on equipment? Uh, so we can remove the need and the fear to uh, make changes because you know the security threats are still gonna be there uh, whether we like them or not. Agreed. Any other words, Stefan? Uh, what can I say that aren't, hasn't already been said? I would just say, you know, my advice to uh, any any network operator uh, trying to navigate these sort of uncharted territories is to just uh, keep keep calm and uh, carry on. And uh, hopefully, you've got uh, a network full of Juniper gear. <laughs> <laughs> I like that commercial. All right, let me get to the last question then. So, talked about what to do at this point. So, and we've touched on this a little bit, but you know, what have we seen or learned over the past month uh, that you believe will be a lasting change post COVID? And that could be in a, how we work in, in more personal fashion, or it could be relative to the network security, how we architect the network, how we think about that. But what do you think is gonna be the, the lasting change post COVID? Um, I hope that, uh, yeah, the employers see the benefit of remote work and working from home a little bit more because usually some of them fear if you're at home, you're not working, um, which obviously isn't true. So um, I think when you have a good mix of being at home and uh, yeah, working at your headquarters, I think that's a very good thing. And I, th I hope that uh, this will survive even after COVID. I think for my side, you know, on what I think will last is that I see a lot of companies who are starting to realize the value of data um, in terms of documentation, in terms of trending, in terms of tracking, et cetera, far more so than before, because when you're working in a kind of distributed environment, all of that data that you can share and work on, and it's not just in people's heads, I think that that shift towards data is going to become very pre prevalent. Um, and this is, it's been happening for a long time. You've been seeing data analysts, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that it's accelerating it. And I think, and I really hope to see that companies do become more data driven rather than thought driven and, and kind of living on wish and prayer, you know, so, so I think that that data and the reliance of it is something that's really coming out during this. And I think that that will stick. Other thoughts? Um, I'd, I'd say, I think I totally agree with the comments that have been said. I, I definitely think we're going to see a lot more remote access type solutions, VDI type solutions. I think this is going to probably cause a pretty big shift towards the cloud in a lot of ways. Um, especially with regards to just backend IT, uh, you know, uh, email, um, file servers, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, but I think the other thing that's, I, you know, for anybody who's ever studied the CISSP, um, I think this is kind of an interesting case study in how we allocate money um, towards preparedness. And, and it's often something that's kind of nebulous to um, determine like how much money should we spend on certain IT initiatives for things like business continuity or disaster recovery or just any kind of continuity of operations type planning. Um, you know, because, you know, there's actually a complex formula that you, you, you would use to try to determine um, how much money do we stand to lose in the event that something of this magnitude were to happen. And you have to determine like what's the likelihood of those types of things happening. But I will say I would imagine there's probably going to be a lot of people that are going to be dusting off those books and putting to practice a lot of those formulas to try to determine, you know, how much money should we actually allocate to um, some of these types of things that maybe we haven't given uh, priority towards in the past. Well, we, we're going from plug numbers and theories in those formulas to now we have actual numbers because people right. have experienced this. So you still yep. have the probability element, but you at least now know if this happens, this is the impact. Yep. 
Any other thoughts? Who wants the last word on what's going to be the lasting impact post COVID? Yeah, I, I think I agree with uh, Stefan. I think there's going to be a huge um, move to the cloud um, on the back of this. There'll, there'll be companies all around the world that are having major issues at the minute that are they're kind of um, probably invisible to us. But I, I think um, you know they'll be planning on what they can do to to mitigate and uh, to move forward. I mean, just to kind of just to dovetail on that. I mean, you know, for the very reasons that Tom Dwyer mentioned earlier about not having somebody on site to actually receive equipment or i mean those kinds of things kind of disappear when we're talking about the cloud right yep. and then also the scaling issues just disappear right because we've got infinite scalability so i think uh i think this is going to be a further impetus uh yep. towards dramatic movement toward the cloud yep. so, so the acceleration of the cloud is is the the last word so look it, it's been a great conversation um i want to thank you all for sharing your time for sharing your wisdom. Um, please stay safe and stay healthy and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. 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 Thanks so much. That was Pleasure. that was really good.